and good evening my fellow writery types and welcome to the writing stream it is monday the first of may it is may already can you believe that <laughs> it has been time where's the time gone what is it's just impossible this this whole business of time moving on with it's well it's it is it's, it's, it's may it's may 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 it be it may it may it it may it well something uh anyway welcome one and welcome all to the writing stream. on this event called day I, I don't normally do bank holidays but um um because because i was so lax and so busy in april it only seemed fair that we we crack on and uh deal with edgar rice burrows once and for all i feel <laughs> let's get it over with shall we um <laughs> and the princess of mars uh who hasn't actually really taken a great deal of part in the story yet uh despite being one third of the way through the book um but there we go never mind anyway before we get into all that uh excitement adventure and really wild things i suppose we ought to do the thing because the thing is the thing and the thing must be done so <laughs> here we go right who's in the chat and it's well, what's happened to my green screen There, I fixed it. Uh, I think I made that worse. Uh, <laughs> all hell the thing. Right, Wintermute GB is here. Of course, of course he is. Wintermute GB is always here. And, and very welcome he is. So, uh, so that's good. Um, and uh, Commander Hope Hoopers is here. Hello, good to see you as well. Um, Habibu is here with his four thumbs up because that's what he does. Uh, thank you very much for the four thumbs up. Habibu Gij is here. And Andy P783 is here. Um, Wintermute and Hakanda Hope Hoopers are having a bit of a chat about stuff. And, and Wintermute is pledging his allegiance to me. Thank you very much. Uh, but only when he's streaming. And except when he's talking about cars, the ZX Spectrum and insurance companies is to be expanded. <laughs> I feel I feel there's a disclaimer in there, would you mute me? Um so there we go. Never mind. <laughs> uh come on the Cedar is here with the with the ever present wombles. Which is good to see. Come on, the JLN here is here. It's here. Bad Monksoft is here, boys. As ever on Wikipedia, should we need his and his skills in such ways? The harpoons are here, ready to invade Arrakis, as ever. Uh the invasion of Iraq is obviously ongoing, has been for several years now, I feel. <laughs> Will it ever be resolved? <laughs> we don't know. Uh, the Iraqis are here, of course, fighting off the invasion of the Harkonnens, uh, always on the defensive, but never, never admitting defeat, uh, which is good to see. Uh, <laughs> scrolling down the list is here. D uh, DRMC Toots is here as well, good to see you. Glenn is here, uh, he's just checking in, um, but he's also checking out. <laughs> That's that's a vote of confidence in Edgar Rice Burroughs. Uh, so there we go. Um, <laughs> good to see you, Glenn, and have a lovely time, whatever you're doing. Um, so, um, yes, Drew just bent space and probably time to... Yeah, I, I do that all the time. There's, there's a series one Star Trek baddie looking by. I think, I think that's probably what it is. I've, I've given the screen a thump and it seems to have settled down slightly, so maybe that's, maybe that's the way to do it. Um, but anyway, never mind. Right, so we're here! <laughs> Welcome back to the first of May and uh, the ongoing writing team. So I've got I've got some a little bit of news for my writing side of things. Is I've got other than one, my dear wife, who is um, been very very busy of late. Um, the proofreaders have all checked in um, for my uh, for my novel, uh, which is which is good. Which means I've got loads and loads of work to do. Yay! Ooh. Um, <laughs> so. Um, so yes, yeah, so I've got that. I've got that sort of stuff to get on with. So I've got to get. I haven't read my book. I haven't touched my book actually for a month, which is weird actually because you kind of then go, oh yeah, I was writing a book, wasn't I? Um, and so I've got to get back in, back into that again, uh, and start fixing things because a few plot holes have been found. Nothing too major, I don't think, but yeah, a few bits and pieces. Which yep, yeah, yep, yeah, that's a fair comment. Um, and lots of commas and mistakes and all the usual stuff that I get wrong. Um, has uh, has Glenn? <laughs> Is Glenn hiding from the stream because he doesn't done any work on the book? Mm, well, could be, could be. <laughs> I have to say, I mean, I finished it. I finished it in the middle of the week, um, having not entirely finished it myself. And uh, that is a good reason, says Glenn. Um, and uh, it, oddly enough, and then, and then, then I did go and watch the film. John Carter, which we should discuss as possibly the second half of the stream, because um, 
<laughs> Having read through it, I'm not sure it's going to be a good idea to spend too great a length of time on the Princess of Arles. Um, yeah, Glenn's actually got some... <laughs> And he's got some actual work to focus on. Uh, every time Drew looks away from the chat, does he? Oh, <laughs> yes, he's hiding behind there, yeah, isn't he? What's causing that one? Oh, there's a bend in the screen. That's why. Let me just whack it again. There we go. Uh, does that help? It's because the screen's not hanging flat for some reason. Um, it's got. It's got a. It's got a warp in the space-time continuum. Literally has got a warp in the space-time continuum. Well, at least in my green screen. That's, that's what's going on there. Um, as you can see, it's top quality stuff. Um, I'm not quite sure where the reflection's coming from. Um, I haven't changed anything as per usual. It's just the, it's just stuff happening. So I don't know what's going on. Never mind. anyway. I, <laughs> Drew's lighting the speech time monster. Yeah, maybe that's what it is. It's just a monster. Get, uh, space isn't curved. It just has folds in it. Yes, that's right. Uh, in fact, I, I think space is just bent, isn't it? Is that right? Um, anyway, there we go. <laughs> folding space um so yes so I, I i did finish the book and i watched the film and actually the film um i was quite impressed with the cgi in the film considering it's a little it's fairly old now it looked it looked good the plot still made no sense whatsoever um <laughs> which at least is true to the book <laughs> so um it's an odd one. This it 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 is an odd one. Uh, yeah, the, the film. Uh, I mean, it's not it's not quite the same as the book, but it's not it's not all that different actually. It's sim sort of a simplified version of the book. It, the space needs heavy iron weights. I suppose it does, but that probably make we make my ceiling fall down. So I'm not going to do that right now. So <laughs> the cloaking devices. It's my hat is interfering with the space time continuum. That's what's going on there. Um, I if, okay, maybe I should just so I can. I've got I've got vibrations in the space time continuum. Uh, what plot? Um, yeah, had pretty girls in bikinis, a cute dog monster. What, what do you want from your space robot? Well, I mean, I suppose that's fair enough. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's a bit weird. So yeah, so I've made a bit of progress, so I'm quite pleased with that. Well, I haven't actually. People have been making progress on my behalf. But uh, so far, the book has been well received. That's the Higara Contravention, which is the first one in my new series, which is imminently coming out. I've got to get my head around and start thinking of a marketing plan next. Um, which is a slightly grandiose term for, hmm, am I going to let people know about this book? Uh, so I need to have a think about that and then probably probably put some efforts into that. In fact, marketing books is probably a stream all of itself because it's not an easy topic, um, not an easy topic at all. So um, I think I've, I've probably done a stream about it in a dim and distant past, um, but um, we'll have to go and find out. Uh, my new book, is it sci-fi or fantasy? It is science fiction. It is very much science fiction. It, you know, um, with a hard science fiction background, but not like a hard science fiction vibe. I don't spend, um, I what I mean by that is it's got real physics for the most part, um, but um, it's not. So it's not fantasy like Star Wars. So it's not. A, it, it's not a space opera in that definition. This is why I don't like genres because, because I can't. I can't do genre. Um, so it's got. It's got real physics for the most part. There's a few made up bits because of stuff you need. Um, but it's still a space opera in the sense it's got people doing things and there's a bit of politics in there and you know space adventures and you know, a bit of pew pew etc etc um so yeah so hard science fiction in its background but not hard science it's not a military science fiction kind of novel if that makes sense <laughs> bindi physics um so uh, roger on the side anyway so there we go buy my new book says winter gb <laughs> there you go marketing strategy done excellent uh <laughs> so that, i mean seriously i've got to have a think about that but um there's lots to be done i need to have a book first i feel um and the marketing strategy will go hand in hand with with the creation of said book um uh, which is one of the things last you have to do nowadays uh, there we go um got another cute monster like shade but i've got some cute characters i don't think i've got any monsters no um uh, because it's set in space most of the time um, I don't think I've got any cute monsters. Maybe I should bring those um, um, uh, going on through there. there. Um, so, has anyone ever read Piers Anthony's Space Opera Begins with Refugee Bio of a Space Tyrant? I've heard of it, but I don't think I've read that one. Um, so, <laughs> offer free waffles with every copy. That's definitely the way to do it. Uh, <laughs> ah, dear. 
there we go. And of course, um, for those of you of UK disposition, we have our we have our king being crowned. No, not crowned. Coronated. <laughs> that sounds like something you do to chicken. Uh, which is about as odd enough. <laughs> My dearest wife, Anita, um, who um, <laughs> said basically that's how we're celebrating. <laughs> See on Sunday. Is it Saturday or Sunday? I can't remember. I think it's Saturday. Uh, or is it Sunday? I don't know. Um, the king. <laughs> so, um, we're, we're having Coronation chicken. <laughs> that's, that's as celebratory as we're getting in the Wagar household. Uh, crowned, dear boy, crowned. Yes, coronated. Well, coronated. Well, I mean, that's what I'm doing to my chicken. <laughs> so, yeah, so we, we've got we, well, we've got an existing king, but he's getting a crown. And there's a whole bunch of pomp and circumstance uh, to do to do with it. Um, and the and the population of the UK has been invited to pledge our allegiance. Now this one caught me a little bit by surprise. Uh, the sort of medieval style. Pledge your allegiance to the king to uphold some stuff and I don't know what it is. Um, needless to say. I'm a, I'm not an anti royalist, but I'm not a royalist. So I I can't look at this pageantry with a little bit of colour. Kind of like, well, it sells postcards. I suppose it must be a reasonably good thing. Um, and you know, and cheap trinkets in Oxford Street. But that's about as far as my interest uh, goes with uh, with with all things royal. Um, because I mean, <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm pretty much with Monty Python here. <laughs> I didn't vote for you. <laughs> so, um, but I'm not um, I'm I'm not a <laughs> I'm not all that fussed to be honest uh, about it. I think. I, do I think the money could probably be better spent? Yes, probably. But you can say that about an awful lot of things in this life. Um, so yes, while it's while it's fairly absurd, it's it's not the most absurd thing. Um, so um, I've never been a royalist, but the last few years have turned me into an anti-royalist. Well, I mean, I, yeah, it's it is difficult. I mean, because they, I mean, <laughs> why do they exist? They exist because they have existed. Um, I believe the peers normally do the pledge, but this time they're inviting the public to give the pledge. So, I mean, we're being invited to pledge our allegiance to the king. What's, I'm, I'm just going to read it out because it, it struck me as a really odd thing. What is the pledge? Let me let me just dig it out. I mean, for those of you who aren't in the UK, are probably thinking, what? But I just thought it was an unusual thing um, to ask people to say. So what are we being asked? Um, public to be invited to pledge... Uh, how do we pledge? Right, so we're, we're being invited to say the following out loud, <laughs> presumably to the television or something. <laughs> I don't quite know how it's supposed to work. Um, I swear that I will pay true allegiance to your majesty, to your heirs and successors. Really? Um, according to law. What does that mean? What law? <laughs> Which law? Um, so help me God. Um, so... <laughs> Quite a few, yeah, quite a lot to unpack in there, basically. So, okay, so I will pay true allegiance to your majesty. What does that mean, true allegiance? To you, your heirs and successors, according to law. So that basically, presumably saying, you know, forever, the royal family, I uh, pledge my allegiance to you forever and ever and amen. Uh, in fact, amen is definitely there as well. <laughs> so help me God. So it's like, okay, for those of us who don't believe in God, and those of us who aren't all that keen on binding ourselves um in a pledge to the royal family forever effectively uh, <laughs> uh so i'm not quite sure what, what, what it's it's not one to me um kind of weird but anyway that's what they're asking us to say so um we've been invited to say that um my reply to the invitation is not family friendly <laughs> so you're gonna swear at the king you're just not gonna swear to the king is that right uh big third 9 gt it's bank all their monday and drew's working yes i know i'm I, i'm doing an extra stream really because otherwise i felt like i abandoned you rather badly in april so it's just guilt trip as far as i'm concerned um um britain is the only country to eliminate the monarchy in full and then totally reverse it and reinstate it yes <laughs> Because we're very consistent here in the UK. <laughs> Apparently, the coronation event of of the king is quite unusual, even for you know, countries that still do have a royal family. Um, Spain hasn't done it since the <laughs> 16th century, apparently, um, and I think the Netherlands has a royal family as well, and they haven't done it since a few hundred years ago. So we're a bit weird. Well, I mean, everyone knows that um, <laughs> we're a bit here in the UK, and it's kind of like. <laughs> 
does feel like now would have been a good opportunity to maybe let's have a bit of a rethink about this whole royal family business. But apparently not. <laughs> We're going to double down on it. Um, so there we go. Um, from a from a purely financial tourist point of view, I wonder how much we'd lose if we scrap. I don't know. I mean, has anybody actually done that calculation? Um, pledge. What is this? It's a Kickstarter for the royal family. <laughs> I wonder what the pledge rewards are. You get your own little embossed crown on a piece of commemorative paper. Atta boy, well done for the pledge. Uh, pledge. Other furniture monitors are available. <laughs> I find it ridiculous that they even consider asking people to pledge allegiance. An archaic, rotten, feudal bunch of cabbages. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Don't beat about the bush there. <laughs> Tell us what you really think. Um, um, so, can anyone recommend a good space sim for the Steam Deck? No arcade crap, please. Uh, Steve's game, that's a very good question. I can't. Um, so, I don't know. I mean, does um, No Man's Sky work on the Steam Deck? Um, that's a question. <laughs> does Elite Dangerous work on the Steam Deck? I, d I don't know. I haven't got a Steam Deck, so I couldn't tell you. Um, <laughs> pledge more than £2,000. Good night. <laughs> I think there might be a few extra zeros in there, but the, the principle is the same. <laughs> um... Commander Cedar says he met Prince Philip when I got a conservation award at the palace. Actually, really chilled and nice bloke. Okay, well, that's good. That's good. Um, Elite Dangerous is bad. Very bad. Lost all faith in it before Drew ditched it. Okay. Let's not, let's not talk about the game that shall not be mentioned, shall we? Because <laughs> we'll get to even more arguments about um, pledging to the king. Anyway, we've got a new king coming. Charles III. Um, Charles I and Charles II came to relatively sticky ends as well so let's let's hope that doesn't happen to Charles III but uh, there we go so um, yes a bit of weirdness going on in the UK what can you say but anyway let's uh, talking about royalty let's get back to Edgar Rice Burroughs because uh, <laughs> that's the point of this stream and uh, let's see where we got to now in last week's exciting episode uh, we were um, I might need to switch off my background here I've just noticed because Microsoft being is but a, a jolly nice picture up but it's going to make the chat really hard to read uh let me how do I switch it off and uh, just no personalize that's the one isn't it let me switch off and go for oh so this is a, I used to know how this all worked um but then I've got Windows 11 now and if, of course everything changes everything changes all the blowers and time right let's like that gone. Right, so we were about to start on chapter 10. Um, uh, Charles Charles II didn't come to us. Which one was it? Was it Charles, was it Charles I? Um, Windows 11, why? Well, I couldn't I couldn't not get Windows 11, unfortunately, because I bought a new computer and it wouldn't give me Windows 10. So I got Windows. To be honest, Windows 11 is just slightly different to Windows 10. <laughs> For no obviously good reason, as far as I can work out, it doesn't seem to be any less good in terms of performance. But um, yes, it was Charles the First, of course. Um, and um, so yeah, so Windows Eleven is just very subtly different to Windows Ten, as far as I can work out. Um, Jay and I had, had to print a poster for the coronation with a portrait of the king on it, split into two sheets. The office printer suddenly became possessed with the spirit of seventeenth-century revolutionary, as it split the image right across his neck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you could you could probably get arrested for things like that. There's probably there's probably some arcane law uh, of of printing out images of the king that are inappropriate. Uh, <laughs> even if the coronation goes well, I bet he'll feel like a right old Charlie. Good man, Mad Monks off. Right, so. Um, we just we, well, we hadn't really met the princess of Mars. We'd, we'd been told that she'd been kidnapped. Um, anyway, so um, here we are with John Carter. He's in the the Green Men's camp. He's got his late, sort of lady friend Sola, who um, is kind of looking after him. He's um, demonstrated that he's pretty darn good at fighting by punching one guy in the face and killing him, which the, the Martians appear to have found quite amusing. Um, and then they've been they've come under attack by some airships. They've basically shot them down, and they've captured the crew of one of the airships and one of the people aboard the airship appears to be this woman who is is is, is you know from a single single glance 
this massive paragraph description of how gorgeous and beautiful she is. So, and uh, it appears, I say, John Carter himself is, is love at first sight with this uh, this lady. Anyway, he starts off this chapter talking about Wooler. Which, now, Wooler is uh, is worth a bit of a pause because Wooler is this sort of Martian dog thing who looks like a frog, has multiple legs, but can run really, really, really fast. Um, and in the John Carter movie, he's actually um, um, portray <laughs> portrayed quite funny. He's, he kind of does look a bit like a frog with lots of legs. And it's just like, <laughs> it's just like stupidly fast. It reminds me of the luggage from... Um, <laughs> From the disc world okay uh it's that sort of kind of kind of attitude so i wonder if terry pratchett was inspired by wooler a little bit uh, because there's there's some quite key um similarities right <laughs> between wooler and the luggage uh and if you don't know what i'm talking about you're gonna have to go and read terry pratchett um because um yeah i, I, I can't explain any more than that um what book is this uh first time chat from sec 2077 it is a princess of mars by edgar rice burroughs um we started looking at well we've been looking at it for a while the luggage uh, terry's luggage had a much worse attitude yeah so will it is this sort of dog well it's it's not really a dog in the sense of how it's described but it kind of acts like a dog so i've called it a martian dog because that's kind of, kind of how i think of it um and and um, the, the luggage was born after observing a, a woman at Bristol Airport and her cantankerous wheeled suitcase. Excellent. <laughs> I don't know a great deal about Terry Pratchett, actually. Um, we, we share the, like, a, a fondness of hats, but I, um, I, I like some of his stuff. But he's not, he's, it's, it, Terry Pratchett, to me, is a bit like the Beatles. Um, <laughs> maybe he's straying into sacrilegious territory here because I'm kind of like, yeah, yeah, I like some of their music. It's OK. <laughs> There's a certain group of people who, when I say things like that, just look at me aghast, right? Uh, <laughs> and Terry Pratchett's in the same, right? Okay, some of his stuff, yes, I chuckled out loud and, and enjoyed it, but some of it, I was like, this is this isn't great. Okay, it's all right, but it's not great. So um, Terry Pratchett, um, yeah, you know, all right. <laughs> I wouldn't I wouldn't say it was everything would stand out brilliant at all so maybe there's a whole bunch of people going what at this point but um Terry Pratchett yeah he's all right he's okay <laughs> guards guards I did enjoy um so um so yeah so um I, you know I'll, I'll read some of his stuff but I'm not I'm not like a massive massive fanboy of Terry Pratchett by any stretch of imagination um so anyway anyway <laughs> back to Edgar Rose Burroughs um um and uh, anyway so he basically he tests Wooler a little bit to see how loyal this this dog thing is and uh basically um and uh yeah so th this this dog thing is very loyal to him so he spends he, i get the impression here that um edgar rice burroughs maybe did have a dog okay uh because he's, his kind of description of it is very kind of master dog kind of relationship so i i, I don't know whether Edgar Rice Burroughs had a dog, but I suspect that he probably did. Um, so, <laughs> a bit like the Beatles, yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, Tiffany aching stuff grows to a beautiful ending as Terry's final. So, yeah, so I, I mean, um, 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 Commander Hope Hooper's Drew, direct question here, I'm wearing a hard hat as a precaution. Do you like this book? What, A Princess of Mars? Um, do I like it? Um, overall, um, no. <laughs> however there are some good little bits in it uh, which i i, I pick up and i i, find, I, I it, this is this is one of the things that's quite hard right um nowadays um is being a i don't know whether it becomes of being a writer and having to critique yourself a lot wherever i come across difficult writing or stuff that i find difficult i <laughs> go into critique mode very very easily uh <laughs> <laughs> um and it's it's this is also tough because of course the books that we've been working with here because of you know um copyright and all those things and availability and stuff and making sure that's free for people to have a look at are old okay so this is a book that's over 100 years old so it's a, it is a bit we, we've got to be a bit careful about applying literary standards of today to stuff that was written over 100 years ago 
Um, it, it's yeah, I think Commander Sea Dweller's right. Um, it's um, it's a chuckle. It's and it's very dated, and it's just a history of sci-fi. Let's see how things have come on. It's I would say in its defence, I would say it's it's a quite a big step forward in style from the previous stuff like War of the Worlds and stuff. Whilst those are very good, um, this is in some ways more readable, but it's it's flowery and it's long-winded, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's more of a space opera than it is a science fiction novel, which is a subtle distinction, which I think it's probably arguably one of the first space operas stroke planetary romances, if you want to get a bit clever about the genre. There are some good bits in it. Um, and so, and, and writing style, yeah, I think I probably would, Mad Monk, so that's a good observation. Is is is, um, is writing style a, is, is something that evolves? I think it does, because it's changed a lot here. This is 1912. Compared to 1895, quite a lot has changed. I mean, that's 17, maybe 20 years. It's, it's a, there's a big shift here. Um, so um, the whole point of the book club was to review old classics. So yeah, we, we are taking a look at it like that. Um, anyway, <laughs> um, this one I found, I mean, this one was a lot more readable than let's say Frankenstein was by Mary Shelley. Um, that was that was hard work, probably because of its age. Whereas this one is more hard work because of its <laughs> meandering story. <laughs> um, the Conan books are similarly old um, and are relevant to theirs back. And uh, so I have to, maybe I have to try that one as well. Um, so anyway, we're now we're now back to the princess. Okay, well we don't know if she's a princess yet, but it's a fairly good observation. This is the obviously the scantily clad uh, lady. Um, on Regain the Plaza, I had my third glimpse. Okay. <laughs> this is on his third glimpse, he's now. Um, um, she approached, she gave me one haughty glance and turned her back full upon me. The act was so womanly, so earthly womanly, uh, that although it stunned my pride, it also warmed my heart with a feeling of companionship. Um, he gets a lot out of just a very single glance. Okay, so um, <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but if a woman gives me one haughty glance and turns her back full upon me, then I'm, <laughs> I'm kind of like, whatever, dear. <laughs> whereas no no he's 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 yeah his pride is stung and it's warmed his heart and uh <laughs> anyway so um yeah quite a lot more um description of the princess yeah so it, it wasn't a glance was it so um, anyway eventually we find out um um and um here what is your name asked Lockquas Tommel um who has <laughs> Yeah, yet another unpronounceable, uh, unpronounceable Martian name. Except when Mon Mothma winks at me. I mean, yeah, I'm a... <laughs> but Mon Mothma, hey, I mean, she's she's my kind of gal. Um, <laughs> anyway, I'm not quite sure how he pronounced this lady's name. Deja, I'm, I'm going for Deja Thoris. I'm assuming it's a soft TH rather than Taurus or Taurus. Um, Thoris. Deja Thoris. Does anybody know? Does anybody care? <laughs> This is and agreed. Yes, Commander Hope. Which this is a bit of dialogue. Actually, somebody is saying something out loud for the first time. Um, what is your name? Deja Torres, daughter of Moore's K. Jack of Helium. Now, this when I first read this, this was a bit confusing. Helium is actually a place on Mars. It's a city. Um, and the, the leaders of these are called Jeddaks. OK, so Jeddak is a leader. Um, helium, I, I was like, what, helium? What does she mean by helium? Um, um, sounds right to me, all versions I've heard pronounced Thoris. Okay, so so Deja Thoris, anyway. Um, and um, uh, she basically explains that they're on a mission uh, doing some, they're on a peaceful mission doing some scientific operations um, to ensure that there was enough air or water on Mars to support life. Um, and um, so she's yeah it's, it's a it was a peaceful mission okay <laughs> in uncharted space um and then she goes and, and then basically um why is it named helium because all the other cities are gone but <laughs> very good um so it, it it wasn't immediately clear to me that helium was a place and then i said ah okay so helium's a place uh why he chose the name helium as a place when he's made up all the other names at this point. I don't really know. It just seemed like a bit of a curious choice. But Helium is basically a city where, um, obviously, Deja is from and, you know, her people. There's another city called 
Danga, I think, which is another red person city. And then there's this place where we are now, which the name of which I've forgotten, uh, which is where the green people of Mars live, the ones with the six arms and the, and the horns on their head. So, um, yeah, so complicated stuff. Right? <laughs> anyway, then she goes into this bit, <laughs> into this bit of this um, uh, exposition. Let's that, let's be fair. Um, she basically tells tells the reader, "This is why we don't like you, green men, because you're really nasty and you're bad tempered and you're." <laughs> You don't like anybody. You hate each other and, and you're just generally bad people. Why she feels this is a good idea <laughs> in the middle of being accused of things. You know, <laughs> insult your host, the people who have captured you. Um, I'm not quite sure. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, she does. Um, um, but uh, what, what's interesting here is it, I, I assume Edgar Rice Burroughs is trying to sort of get across the fact that she's... Um, she's very princessy okay she sees royalty and she has this effect on people because rather than rather than basically <laughs> giving her a slap as as she probably deserves after what she's just said um they basically uh, you know they sit there silently intently looking at the young woman for several moments after she's speaking and then um she's <laughs> dumbstruck into well you know that princess girl she she, she makes a good point uh um anyway so yeah so she's she's basically you know she's basically impressed everybody um so it's um um uh yeah so i don't know um but anyway so oddly enough then she does get whacked in the face <laughs> so um he leaps down from, this is um tars tarkas uh, he leaps down from the steps of the rock, striking the frail captive, a powerful frail across the way. She was felled to the floor, placed the, his foot upon her prostrate form and turned towards the assembled council and broke into peals of horrid, mirthless laughter. Um, oh, sorry, no, that's not Tars Tarkas. It's the other one. Um, so this is not very clear. Uh, oh, no, just then a young warrior, another young warrior. OK, so um, um, John Carter thinks that Tars Tarkas would strike this young warrior. Um, um did anyway so it's it shows it's you know there's um basically Tars Tarkas doesn't but then basically <laughs> John Carter decides that he's not having this and um um he jumps up on him and starts beating him to death um smack 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 um and um <laughs> um and in, in a moment or two, he bleeding and lifeless, he was to the floor. Okay, so she just, just murders him there and then, right? Um, Deja Taurus raised herself upon one elbow and watched the battle with wide staring eyes. When I regained my feet, I raised her in my arms and bore her to one of the benches at the side of the room. But, you know, just nobody else is kind of watching. Anyway, so um, then for some reason, they, they have time to have a long conversation. So, and this is this is one of those things that's a bit weird about Edgar Rice Burroughs in a way this comes across. It's like, you know, um, you know, so she gets the chance to ask him, you know, what strange manner of person are you? Where do you come from? So they're basically having their sort of first love chat because this is obviously the love interest for John Carter. You probably figured that out because it's pretty damned obvious, isn't it? Um, anyway, he explains who he is and where he's come from. And then eventually... <laughs> The other Martians are going, yeah, can, can, we, can we take part of this story again? Um, and um, so um, anyway, he reveals that he got, um, um, he learnt, you know, the Barsumian Mars, Martian language from Solar and so on and so forth. Anyway, so it goes on like that for a, a while. And um, you know, clearly, it's love at first sight between John Carter and Deja Torres. So then we get then we get the entire chapter with Deja Torres, um, and um, so etc. 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 And then um, you know, it's basically um, it is you know, it's a bit sickening really <laughs> by modern standards. It's all very sweet, but. Um, and uh, the language here, the dialogue is surprisingly old fashioned. Um, 
you know, this is this is Deja Torres speaking. And where to then would your prisoner escape should you leave her? She was referring to herself in the third person. Unless it was to follow you and crave your protection and ask for your pardon for the cruel thoughts she has harboured against you these past few days. It's like, <laughs> just speak in English, please, dear. dear. Um, um, so, um, so yeah, it's, 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 it, yeah, it's, <laughs> You, you've, you've got a little stuff you, you have you have got some stuff um, and it goes on for quite a while now in the interests of time I'm going to skip ahead to the bits that I found interesting <laughs> okay so um, and um, uh, yeah so um, th there are some bits and why was she speaking English I mean yeah I know I know um, uh, and, and they basically they have long conversations okay about stuff and you know things and it's basically exposition about how mars got into it um and so on and so forth um and then anyway so he's still uh, john carter is still sort of well respected by the green men um um i've never had much difficulty suspending my disbelief in him but can't for this just ask too much of me does they drive burrows so yeah so um um tal hedges you've got to read the bit about him being so ultra horny the other martian sticky <laughs> I do come across that. That was really, really, really. The the bit, the, the one thing that I, yeah, but there's a bit of world building that I do want to call attention to, which does happen later in the story. Um, I mean, if we go back to the the overall plot for a moment, what basically happens? Okay, so he's he 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 um um he meets um Deja Torres. He um um you know basically falls in love with Deja Torres. Um, Sola tells her a story. Now Sola is quite interesting in the sense that um. There's there's a bit of internal family strife, um, as described by Sola. Is that is that bit um, that bit described by Sola um, in in this chapter here, or is it um, in the, in the previous one? Uh, maybe it's in here. Um, so um, back up a bit. Where was it? Um, Oh no, the chapter headings. <laughs> it's a thing in those old books. Um, oh, a prisoner of power. Okay, so it was in here somewhere. Is it? Uh, I did. I remember. I remember this um, jumping out. Where was it? Uh, oh yeah, that's right. Okay, so um, so yeah, so basically. Um, that he wants to escape with Deja to sort of save her from this Loquaz Tommel guy. Um, um, and and as, the, there we go, as described by ourselves, this monster, i.e. Loquaz, was the exaggerated personification of all the ages of cruelty, ferocity and brutality from which he had descended. Cold, cunning, calculating he was. Also, in marked contrast to most of his fellows, a slave to that brute passion which the waning demands for procreation upon their dying planet has almost stilled in the Martian breast. OK, so basically he's a bit he's a bit a randy old guy. <laughs> um, and the thought that the divine. Yeah. Slay on the old divine Deja Torres might fall into the clutches of such an abysmal atavism, started the cold sweat upon me. Far better that we save friendly bullets for ourselves at last, that is the brave frontier women of my lost land, who took their lives rather than fall into the hands of the Indian braves. Okay, so I didn't know about that. Is that is that is that true? Um um yeah, American folks on the stream that, that frontier women would shoot themselves rather than fall into the hands of the Native Americans. Um I, I suppose it could be. I, I don't know. Is that is that a thing? Was that a thing? Um anyway, so it's you know, it's it's um it, it's quite <laughs> that that bit did jump out, that was quite interesting. Um anyway, so they eventually do escape, and Solar basically helps them escape. Um and um um this this chapter heading is a bit of a, <laughs> a bit of a, um, a a misname a love making on mars but it's not really love making as we would understand it um but it's kind of like courtship i suppose <laughs> to use another old-fashioned word lucky luigi hello there uh, um good to see you yes the chapter love making on mars it sets things up to quite a high tone but it's it's got nothing in it of all that excitement it's basically courtship on mars is what he means um so basically he uh, i think he 
ends up offending Deja in this by doing something that he doesn't understand. Um, and um, she, she gets the hump with him for quite some time. Um, now, um, um, this, this bit was interesting. <laughs> it's another bit of slightly wacky world building. Um, um, they have me down in the pits below the buildings helping mix their awful radium powder. I think, I think Edgar Rice Burroughs chose radium at random here because it sounded cool. Um, it's a bit of it's a bit of quantum, okay, uh, to use twenty first century cool words, um, and make their terrible projectiles. You know that these have been manufactured by artificial light, as exposure to sunlight always results in an explosion. You have noticed their bullets explode when they strike an object. Well, the opaque outer coating is broken by the impact, exposing a glass cylinder, almost solid, in the forward end of which is a minute particle of radium powder. And the moment the sunlight, even though diffused, strikes this powder, it explodes with a violence which nothing can withstand. And if you ever witness a night battle, you will notice the absence of these explosions. Well, the morning following the battle will be filled at sunrise with the sharp detonations of exploding missiles fired the preceding night. That's extremely damaging. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, so curious weapons that these Martians use. So I think radium, radium was a new thing. Anyway, um, Deja Torres alternatively seems incredibly smart and knowledgeable, um, and then incredibly stupid, basically on demand <laughs> for whatever the plot requires. So every so often she is, um, she's either incredibly um, knowledgeable because she's telling us something about. <laughs> The environment or she's um uh, very prideful and kind of arrogant because she's a princess um or she's just stupid and keeps getting captured so that john carter has to rescue her so uh <laughs> that seems to be her purpose in the story um poor girl um they have ultra lethal weapons as long as the sun is shining <laughs> it's very very strange um so yes yeah, there's a lot of mix of things like that in here um Anyway, so finally, finally, we get to the you know the, the bit of the the the, um, the subject here. I loved Deja Torres. The touch of my arm upon her naked shoulder, <gasps> steady on everybody, naked shoulder, uh, had spoken to me in words I would not mistake, and I knew I had loved her since the first moment that I met hers in that time on the Plaza of the Dead City, where he got a simple glance at her, <laughs> but love at first sight. Boom, there we go. Um, <laughs> Uh, takes chapters to explain the hump. Yeah, I mean, she gets the hump. Oh, OK. So anyway, so there's a lot of slightly soppy stuff. OK, well, John Carter basically mopes around thinking, oh, I love her, but I'm not going to tell her. And if I don't tell her, then she won't know. And if she doesn't know, then she won't be able to do anything. And then, But she's a princess and I'm just a guy from Virginia. And he, OK, it's all very cliché, but I suppose it was <laughs> I suppose it was new once. So um isn't she ten foot tall? I don't know. I, I uh, are they are they a different size or is that the other Martians? Um, so <laughs> fell for a girl in a red bikini. I know. Um, anyway, so and yeah, and and here, look, um, um, you know, so it's all I do. do. <laughs> this is all the sort of stuff we take the Mickey out of now. Do people kiss then in this in Mars? <laughs> Um, and and do you have parents and brothers? Do you have a lover? <laughs> question mark, just randomly chucking a question in, uh, you know, etc., etc., etc. Oh, this was love. <laughs> I was a fool, but I was in love. Oh, yeah, it's like it really just get up with the story, uh, <laughs> please. <laughs> it's pretty sickening for a while. Um, anyway, so um, now um, there is a bit in here, a bit further on, okay, because what actually happens, let's let's summarize the story a little bit, because basically um, they, they plan escape. Um, it doesn't go well, okay, and they get they get hunted down. Um, but what he does discover is is a little bit about what the kind of um, the big problem on Barsoom or Mars is. Right, is that there's this atmosphere factory, okay, that creates the atmosphere, and it <laughs> it works in a very exciting way, okay, um, and it's it's basically if if it doesn't keep working, then then um, Mars Mars will, yeah the atmosphere will go, okay, um, so let me find you the section where is it because this is <laughs> this is um, this this is pretty weird okay um okay so the, he, he discovers this man 
Okay, so anyway, so they try to escape. Um, Dejah Thoris and Sola have. Uh, he's basically yeah. They they try to recapture them. Basically, Dejah Thoris and Sola. He basically bravely stays behind to be captured while they make their escape. Um, from the green men um, and um, he falls in um, with this this guy and um, he bumps into this atmosphere factory okay um, now um, what happens here is that he discovers how the, how the um, how the how the atmosphere factories work okay um, and um, it's <laughs> it's it's quite weird uh, um, and he can and for some reason John John Carter can overhear the guy's thoughts um, which is um, just a lot device as far as I can work out um, anyway so the old man sorts and talks with him for hours um, and the building in which I found myself, right, contained the machinery which produces the artificial atmosphere which sustains life on Mars. So Mar the, the Martian atmosphere is artificially produced. The secret of the entire process hinges upon the use of the ninth ray. OK, one of the most beautiful scintillations which I had noted emanating for the great stone in my host's diadem. OK, so he's wearing some sort of thing and it's got rays coming out of it. I don't know. OK. Um, <laughs> This ray is separated from the other rays of the sun. Okay, so the sun gives off at least nine rays. Um, I don't know where the other eight are or what what they are, but there's there's at least nine, and the ninth one is important. Okay, bear that in mind because this explanation is is pretty fantastical. Okay, um, the the ray is separated from the other rays of the sun by means of finely adjusted instruments placed upon the roof of the huge building. Right, so they're, they're, okay, big building. Uh, separating sunlight into multiple types of ray three causes of which is used for reservoirs in which the ninth ray is stored okay so it's some sort of light that's separated out and stored in a reservoir um, this product is then treated electrically <laughs> okay or rather certain proportions of refined electric vibrations are incorporated with it right and the result is then pumped into the five principal air centers of the planet, where, as it is released, contact with the ether of space transforms it into atmosphere. <laughs> I mean, the midi chlorians have got nothing on this, have they? <laughs> let's just, okay, let's just let's just unpack this one a little bit. Okay, uh, so okay, so you got some sunlight, right? Okay, so there's some instruments on the roof which capture sunlight and split it into rays. That that's a kind of okay. So it's kind of like a weird prism thing. Three quarters of which, which is an oddly precise amount, uh, is used for reservoirs in which the ninth ray. So, so okay, so you're storing some sort of light in a reservoir. Not quite sure how that works, but hey, let's 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 roll with that for a moment. This product. I light is then treated electrically. Uh, <laughs> okay, <laughs> and th this particular this 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 particular just makes me laugh every time I read it. Are uh, rather certain proportions of refined electric vibrations are incorporated with it. <laughs> what the hell does that mean? <laughs> And the result is then pumped into the five principal air centers of the planet, where as it's released. So okay, so you mix you you, you capture some light. You stick it in a bucket of some kind. You add some electricity to the light. Um, you then, or or maybe refine the electric vibrations <laughs> of the light. Uh, you then pump that <laughs> into some air centres around the planet somehow. And then when it comes in contact with the ether of space, <laughs> So when the light with some electricity in it comes in contact with the ether, uh, it, it turns into it turns into atmosphere. <laughs> so what what you have, my friends, here is whatever whatever stupid justification you have for any piece of. Uh, techno babble ever in the history of science fiction there's no way you can make it worse than what Edgar Rice Burroughs wrote here <laughs> 
Drew, you've never electrified light in the bucket in your garage. I <laughs> oddly enough. No, I haven't. Um, so, um, uh, I used to live near an atmosphere factory in Edinburgh. They called it a brewery, though. <laughs> so, the thing is, this, this is written. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> I was supposed to think this slightly serious. Um, what's interesting is it goes on. There's always a sufficient reserve of the ninth ray stored in the great building to maintain the present Martian atmosphere for a thousand years. OK, that's that's quite a lot. And the only fear, as my new friend told me, was that some accident might befall the pumping apparatus. <laughs> um, there's just a lot of made up stuff here okay so every red martian is taught during earliest childhood the principles of the manufacture of the atmosphere but only two at one time ever hold the secret of ingress to the great building so everyone knows how to make the atmosphere but only two people out of the entire population know how to get into the building um so um which is built with walls 150 feet thick is absolutely unassailable and even the roof being guarded from assault by aircraft by a glass covering five feet thick wow um, sci-fi with made up stuff it's it's just I mean it's just it's just seriously made up stuff I think that's the thing the opposite when I was reading this it was quite late and I was just laughing <laughs> so anyway um, and then lots of other things are being made up okay so um, you know, the, the doors are opened by telepathic means um, and the locks are so finely adjusted that the doors are released by the action of a certain combination of thought waves. So not only is this place like mega secure, you can only open it by thinking at it in the right way. Um, so um, anyway, so uh, yeah, and a little bit of a plot device here. So to experiment with my newfound toy, I thought to surprise him into revealing this combination, asked him in a casual manner how he managed to unlock the massive doors for me. And uh, uh, he, he thinks nine mind nine martian sounds um and then so john carter magically now knows how to open the doors which of course comes in useful later on um i know five foot thick glass doesn't sound like it's all that strong grand slam bombs dropped by lancaster's 40 years ago could penetrate 20 foot of reinforced concrete <laughs> so there you go so it, you know had the raf be around that wouldn't have been a problem at all um Anyway, so 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 lots more sort of stuff like this. And then there's basically lots more escaping and lots more chasing around. And it goes on for a long, 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 long time. OK, and eventually, eventually, um, he finally catches up with. Um, oh, there's a there's a there's a quite nice little interview when he's in an arena and he has to fight this other guy, but they decide to try and escape together, which they do, and then they get captured again. And <laughs> it goes on for ages, ages, and ages, and ages. Um, and then um, th th here's another bit about okay, here's the background. This this ninth ray shows up again. This was quite interesting. So um, um, Kantos Khan, who's this guy, he kind of met in the arena. Um, he's, and teaches him the intricacies of flying and repairing the dainty little contrivances which the Martians use for this purpose. OK, so the ninth ray, if you mix it with electricity and put it in contact with the ether, it turns into atmosphere. Um, but also, um, if you put this stuff, this ninth ray into an engine, which is based on radium, um, <laughs> somehow um, oh, no, sorry, this isn't the ninth ray. This is the eighth ray. So the eighth ray provides buoyancy. OK, so if you infuse your your apparatus with the eighth ray, it suddenly floats. The medium of buoyancy is contained within the thin metal walls of the body and consists of the eighth bus human ray or ray of propulsion, as it may be termed in view of its properties. OK, so basically what Edgar Rice Burroughs has done, he's basically said, right, rays and radium. Radium gives off all sorts of interesting rays and each different ray does a different thing. So the, the ninth ray cre creates atmosphere. The eighth ray provides propulsion <laughs> because this ray, like the ninth ray, is unknown on Earth because we haven't discovered it. But um, uh, <laughs> they've learned that it's the eighth solar ray which propels the... Uh, OK, so <laughs> here's, here's some good physics coming up. OK, they have learned that it is the eighth solar ray that propels the light of the sun to the various planets. 
and it is that the individual eighth ray of each planet which reflects or propels the light thus obtained out into space once more. The solar eighth ray would be absorbed by the surface of Barsoom, but the Barsoomian eighth ray, which tends to propel light from Mars into space, is constantly streaming out from the planet, constituting a force of repulsion of gravity, which is then conf which, when confined, is able to lift enormous weights from the surface of the ground. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it's 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 just magic right but anyway um so anyway so they, they're using light rays to lift their ships off the ground okay uh <laughs> so it's, it's a bit weird um and and this this you know he basically even adds a little bit of law to kind of try to add it up. So during the early years of the discovery of this ray, many strange accidents occurred before the Martians learned to measure and control the wonderful power they had found. In one instance, some nine hundred years before, the first great battleship to be built with eighth ray reservoirs was stored with too great a quantity of the rays, and had sailed up from Helium with five hundred officers and men never to return. Her power of propulsion for the planet was so great that it carried her far into space, where she. Which she can still be seen today by the aid of powerful telescopes hurtling through the heavens 10,000 miles from Mars, a tiny satellite that will thus encircle Barsoom to the end of time. Poor unfortunate folks. Uh, <laughs> so, so I mean, it's quite a nice little feature, but it's just it's just wacky lore. Um, so, so there we go. Anyway, so there's a very tedious piece in here which I won't go into too much, where basically Deja Torres gets very upset with our hero, John Carter, for reasons which she won't tell him. So basically she has a huff. It's <laughs> she won't tell him what she's done. He's mortally offended her um, because he's broken some unknown rule of Martian etiquette. Um, but um, um, and, and, but he doesn't know what it is. So yeah, they, they part on not very good terms and then she gets captured and yeah, has to, he has to rescue her again. But what we discover is that there's actually a war going on between two of the red peoples um, uh, on Mars. So that you have the Helium bunch of which Deja Thoris is the princess. Um, and you've got Z Z Z Zodanga, Zodanga, which is the other bunch of red dudes who are basically at war with Helium. Um, and then the green warriors, the, you know, the other Martians, um, are basically kind of they're just at war of anybody because they like fighting as far as I can tell. So yeah, so, so she's still upset with it. She's she's upset with it for a long, long, long time. Time. Eventually, we do find out what the problem was, but it's such a difficult one to well, Basically, he it's something like it's. Let me get this right. It's something like um, because he killed a warrior for her, but didn't claim her as his princess. Um, basically, he's in Martian custom. He's rejecting her. Um, and um, so therefore she gets the hump um, because he, he didn't um, um, he, he didn't didn't do Martian customs properly because um, the fact that she's clearly aware that he's not from Mars and therefore wouldn't have known what Martian customs for appears to <laughs> completely have missed her mind for the purposes of the plot so um, um, however, you know, she, she she does eventually forgive him. So there we go. Um, so uh, <laughs> women saying I'm fine. <laughs> That's right. There we go. Uh, we, yeah, let's not go there. That's far too dangerous. Um, anyway, so it turns out there's a war between Helium and Zodanga. And the only solution they can find is, you know, surprise, surprise. Princess of Helium has to marry the Prince of um, Zodanga. Uh, and then there will be peace, right? Um, and um, so, um, unfortunately for John Carter, he stumbles across this conversation before he gets to have a direct face-to-face yeah, -face chat with um, Deja. So basically she says um, um, that, uh, um, you know, she meets with the Zedangans and uh, basically, you know, reluctantly, she doesn't really want to get married to this guy, but, you know, she will for the purposes of peace to stop Helium being destroyed. Um, and so she says, yes, um, there's no other reason I, I will marry you, blah, 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 blah. Um, um, John Carter overhears this conversation and hears his, his, you know, his unrequited love. He's like, oh, no. But um, 
Although I heard it from my own ears, I could not believe it. I must search out her apartments and force her to repeat the cruel truth to me alone before I would be convinced, etc., etc., etc. So he's acting like a lovesick teenager. Um, <laughs> um, anyway, so he, he tries to have a chat with here. Um, and and what's, <laughs> what's interesting about this is that um, she's got four guards guarding her, you know, to keep trying to keep her safe. So basically he kills all of them, barges in, um, <laughs> to meet her, it's like she'd be splattered and covered in blood. Um, um, so, um, anyway, so they have her basically, oh, yes, but I didn't know, and you didn't know, and we don't know, but there's still, you know, you can't do this and you can't do that. Um, you know, and I didn't know about your customs and etc., 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 etc. Just get back to the story. Um, I, I, you know, you know, forgive me, you forgive this, you signed my death warrant, and blah, 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 blah. Anyway, it turns out that um, he can't kill this guy, uh, who, uh, Saab Thaan, there we are. This is the guy that she's promised to marry. Um, but um, basically, so his solution is, right, I'll go murder him, and then we can be together, right? So, um, whether or not uh, Deja Torres is all that concerned about this fact that there's John Carter will go around murdering people just so he could be with her, it sounds slightly obsessive to me. I think if I was Deja Torres, I'd be slightly alarmed. But anyway, she doesn't seem to be. Um, anyway, she says, no, you can't you can't go murder him because if you murder him, I can't. Um, <laughs> I, I may not. For, yeah, the Martian customs are strange. I may not wed the man who slays my husband, even in self-defense. It's custom. So basically, Deja Thoris conjures up whatever strange Martian, Martian custom she needs to continue the story and make things more complicated, as far as I can work out. Uh, <laughs> um, anyway, so he can't murder the guy that she's going to have to marry. He needs to get basically it's complicated. He needs to get somebody else to kill the guy that she she's going to marry, so that he doesn't kill him, etc., etc., etc. I don't know. Um, anyway, so this goes on for a while. Um, da, 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 da. And then there's basically a big battle. Yeah, you know there's a big battle coming, okay? So the, the whole... I was going to say, <laughs> I fall in love with this guy. What's he like? Well, um, he's very devoted. <laughs> what do you mean by that? Well, anybody who stands in his way that he doesn't like at all between him and me, he just, he just murders them. <laughs> <laughs> so he's summing out the contract kill. Yeah, that's basically what he does. Um, anyway, so lots and lots of stuff in in that sort of vein. A bit of jumping around, a bit of heroism, um, lots and lots of slitting throats and killing people, and kind of basically a lot of battles. Um, um, so it, and some of that's not too bad. Okay, um, Tars Tarkas suddenly realizes actually that John Carter is not too bad a guy, and he says yes. You're the first friend I've ever had. So it's all a bit kind of like, yay. And basically, John Carter gets the green men to follow him into battle to defeat the Zodankans and rescue Helium. Um, and so he basically fights them to a standstill. Um, and um, everyone's huzzah. And in the final battle, um, well, they basically destroy Zodanga. Um, and then... Um, um, he basically rescues Asia. Saab Thaan, um, they have a they have a fight, but basically um, he can't kill him because if he kills him, he can't marry Asia Taurus, right? Um, uh, but, you know, he's still fighting away. Um, they they try to kill her anyway, so he's trying to stop them from killing Asia Taurus in kind of revenge. And then eventually, um, uh, where is it? Uh, Tars Tarkas. Um, swings in um, and then basically kills Saab Thaan. So that uh, John Carter didn't kill Saab Thaan. Uh, so it's all okay. Um, so um, anyway, so uh, there we go. Lots of destruction. Um, and then eventually she basically <laughs> says, ah, oh, right, so you didn't kill him. Uh, you've rescued my city. You've wiped out... <laughs> The bad guys you brought the green men on you're pretty you're a pretty darn impressive guy actually john carter you know what um i will marry you after all right <laughs> um 
So thus, in the midst of a city, a city of wild conflict filled with the alarms of war, with death and destruction, reaping their terrible harvest around it, did Deja Thoris, Princess of Helium, true daughter of Mars, the god of war, promise herself in marriage to John Carter, gentleman of Virginia. Now, <laughs> that's how gentlemen conduct themselves. Um, I shot the sheriff, but I did not kill Sam Than. Exactly right. Uh, Tom Starker says, hey, John, need someone slaughtered? As it happens. Um, Anyway, so they destroy Zodanga pretty much. Thing they capture battleships and all sorts of spoils of war, um, and they basically <laughs> they parade around, going, "Aren't we great?" for a while, um, and um, and basically destroy everything else. Um, there's a um, you know, there's they 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 give him medals and they say complimentary things and they you know they they. Um, they, they do finally get married. Now, what's interesting here is um, after all the kind of congratulations, which go on for quite a while, you know, because John Carter's clearly a pretty gnarled, impressive dude, um, you know, becomes the greatest living warrior of Barsoom and <laughs> et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, um, and then, so, so for 10 days, you know, um, feasting and entertainment because they won the battle. And then um, nine years passes. Okay, so... <laughs> Just, just in, you know, just in, the, in, in, in the space of a paragraph, nine years of you know, presumably happy marriage to uh, to Deja Torres, um, and um, then, you know, just at the end of the story, when you, yeah, you think kind of well, everything's okay, right? Everything's good, um, um, everything, everything's fine. Um, Basically, um, Tars Mordos comes back with a, uh, um, you know, a bit of bad news. He turns up with a bit of bad news. This morning, he says, word reached the several governments of Barsoom that the keeper of the atmosphere plant that we went to before has made no wireless report for two days and nor had almost ceaseless calls upon him from a score of capitals elicited a sign of response. Um, the ambassadors of the other nations asked to take the matter in hand and hasten the assistant keeper to the plant. Yeah, because there's only two guys in the entirety of Mars who knows that this thing, who can open it, right? Uh, apparently he didn't kill anybody the whole nine years. Everything was peaceful. Um, all day, a thousand cruisers have been searching for him until now that one returns bearing his dead body, which was found in the pits beneath his house, horribly mutilated by some assassin. So somebody has murdered the keeper of the atmosphere plant. Um, I do not need to tell you what this means to Barsoom. It would take months to penetrate those mighty walls because we've got no way of drilling through ten through five feet of glass. <laughs> um, in fact, the work has already commenced and there will be little to fear were the engine of the pumping plant running as it should and they have all for hundreds of years. But the worst, we fear, has happened. The instruments show a rapidly increasing air pressure on all parts of Barsoom. The engine has stopped. <laughs> Suddenly. Uh, it's like, so gentlemen, uh, he concluded, we have at best three days to live. That's it, sorry, no problem. <laughs> That's it. We got three days. That's it. We're doomed. What? Uh, so th there's a, there's absolute silence for several minutes while they, they ponder this. Um, anyway, so um, <laughs> Deja Torres is her usual helpful self. She says, "Well, we've been very happy, John Carter, and I think whatever fate overtakes us, it permits us to die together." So she doesn't react like I fear feel most women would which would be okay so what are we going to do about this then <laughs> there must be a way to stop it no she's completely at ease with it oh well we're going to die at least we're together uh, anyway so <laughs> some strange reason here okay so you've got three days to live so basically they spend the next two days apparently doing nothing <laughs> The next two days brought no notable change in the air supply, and we didn't do anything either. We just hung around for two days going, well, that's a damn shame, we're going to die on the third day. But on the morning of the third day, everybody um, st starts finding it difficult to breathe. OK, um, and towards the middle of the day, the weaker started to succumb. And within an hour, the people of Barsoom were sinking by the thousands into unconsciously. Um, and then um, uh, basically they all say, OK, well, <laughs> Time to say goodbye. The days of greatness are over. Tomorrow's sun will look about the dead world. Um, and then <laughs> Deja Thoris keeps going with this. Kiss me, John Carter. I love you. I love you. It's cruel that we must be torn apart just when we were starting on the life of love and happiness. Um, and then... <laughs> oh, 
<laughs> more than halfway through the third day, John Carter goes, right, I've had enough of this. Uh, it shall not be, my princess, he cries. There is, there must be some way. Um, and John Carter, i.e. me, who has fought his way through a strange world for love of you, will find it. Okay, <laughs> for some strange reason, John Carter waits for two and a half days. <laughs> <laughs> the world is slowly suffocated to death. Um, and then decides to leap into action. <laughs> um, you know, and suddenly he remembers, ah, oh, I know, I overheard the, you know, the tele telepathic way to get into the air purifier thingamajiggy pump thing with the night three. Ujibu flip electric infusation <laughs> storage pumping thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, get me a flyer quick the swiftest flyer the most I can save Barsoom yet so I've got to be a hero um, anyway so uh, kissing Deja Torres a dozen times <laughs> so he's, he's like, no yes he's still not wasting he's not dithering about you know he's straight he's straight to the emergency he doesn't doesn't stop to give his girlfriend you know, a kiss or two uh, <laughs> anyway he's charging around um, so then he charges along, okay, to get back to the air purifier. Um, if I can open these doors, is there a man who can start the engines, I asked. Um, and there's one guy there who basically says, yes, if you can open the doors, I can restart the thing and we'll, we'll be saved. But nobody else knows the secret of these locks, <laughs> which is a little bit of a weak point in the design of the thing. But anyway, um, anyway, he's starting to suffocate. It's getting very, very bad. Um, and he basically uses the telepathy thing that he overheard with the nine sounds, gets the doors open, they crawl inside, and he sinks unconscious upon the ground, and hopefully the Martian dude um, switches the air purifier on. But we don't know. Bum, bum, bum. Okay. Anyway, in the last chapter, bizarrely, he wakes up after passing out in the air purifier. He <laughs> wakes up uh, and he's back on Earth. <laughs> in the cave where he started from, uh, back in Arizona on the same ledge which ten years before I'd gazed with longing upon Mars. And he can see Mars in the distance. 48 million miles away. Uh, did the Martian reach the pump room? We don't know. Did the vitalizing air reach the people of the distant planet in time to save them? We don't know. Was my Deja Thoris still alive, or did her beautiful body lie in cold death beside the tolly girl, the implicated in the second garden of the inner courtyard of the palace of Tardis, but the Jedic of Helium? <gasps> we don't know. <laughs> For ten more years. Okay, he likes his. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh... For 10 years, I've waited and prayed for answers to my questions. For 10 years, um, I've been trying to find a way back to Mars. Okay. Um, anyway, so what we learn is that in the last 10 years, basically, the mine had lots of gold in it. So he's used that to build his own um, wealth back on Earth. Uh, okay. And uh, um, anyway, so, and he's, you know, he's basically looking back at Mars, thinking, well, I, I, I got. <laughs> got to get back there somehow and I sit here tonight in my little study overlooking the Hudson just 20 years have elapsed since I last opened my eyes on Mars so yes yeah, 20 years he was 10 years on Mars now he's been 10 years back on Earth again in this last chapter um, and he's yeah he's still pining after Deja Torres I can see her shining in the sky through the little window by my desk and tonight she seems calling to me again as she has not called before since that long dead night I think I can see across that awful abyss of space a beautiful black-haired woman standing in the garden of a palace. And at her side is a little boy who puts his arm around her as he points to the sky towards the planet Earth, while at their feet is a huge and hideous creature with a heart of gold, which is presumably a ruler. Um, I believe that they are waiting there for me, and something tells me that I will soon know. Bam, bam, bam! The end! <laughs> Princess of Mars. <laughs> so, uh... <laughs> Um, what's interesting is there are several more chapters, uh, several more instances, shall we say, of of, of, of this story that goes on for quite some time. Um, um, I haven't read them. Uh, I'm not sure <laughs> necessarily so that I can bring myself to read them. Um, but I imagine it's pretty similar vein from here on out. Um, so uh, <laughs> it, it, it's kind of like, why did you why did you do that? Why did I mean? It's an odd choice, you know, here at the end of this bit, it's kind of like, um, 
you know, we have, um, yeah, that would be the perfect place to end the story. Um, you know, yeah, John Carter, you're a great guy and, you know, fantastic that you're here with Miles on this and you brought peace and you fight the battle and blah, blah, blah. That seems like a perfect end of the story. Anyway, then there's just this weird, weird bit where they spend three days dying and then go, ah, hang on a minute. Wouldn't it be great if we tried to save Mars? Yeah, that's a good idea. Um, and then he sort of somehow teleports back to Earth and, and has been here for 10 years, pondering why he's come back um so three books in the first trilogy get much better explaining a lot in book three okay so maybe maybe book three is worth worth worthy so um in summary then um it's not a bad yarn i mean it's got a lot of cliches in it but it, but it it's um you know they probably they probably necessarily weren't cliches <laughs> when this book was written okay um I don't, I don't know i mean maybe they were but um you know the um yeah the princess who falls in love with the with the pauper is is a, is a story that's as old as time isn't it but um the movie uses the explanation finally alluded to in book three yes yeah, so there were sort of aliens and weird stuff going on there so um <laughs> no no more of this i surrender unconditionally but no more so um i think i think we've, we've given edgar rice burroughs a good good outing i mean on the plus side, you know, a good imagination, some good ideas in there. Um, some of the executions are a bit weird. Um, the, the whole love story is a little bit kind of like, oh, bit, you know, <laughs> I suppose it was kind of okay at the time. Um, um, she's she's way too adoring, is Deja Torres, um, <laughs> for my liking. Um, but um, and she gets the hump very very easily. Um, and why was his body locked in a tomb with a lock on the inside? Well, we didn't really get an answer to that one. So I presume that comes later in the um, later in the in the scenario. Um, it wasn't flatland. Um, no, it wasn't. Was that was that had some interesting things in it as well. But it was an odd story. Um, take full response. So I mean, as a as an early example of the planetary romance stroke space opera, I think it's quite good. I mean, it's got a he it's got a larger than life hero. It's got some wacky weaponry. It's got flying machines. Uh, it's got a princess that needs rescuing. There's lots of space battle type stuff. There's some weird technology going on. So all the kind of ingredients are there. It's just it's just a bit of a mess um, overall. But is that is that our modern standards demanding a little bit more stuff? You know, it does give me the impression that he wrote it chapter by chapter going, I wonder what's going to happen next rather than actually having a plot. Um, so I would guess and I don't know, but I would guess I would have a hunch that this was um, a bit of a panster novel uh, rather than a plotted novel. I think it's kind of like, ah, OK, so I'm gonna, they're going to get they're going to escape. Then they're going to get rescued. Then they're going to get stuck in the arena. Then they're going to get rescued again. Then we're going to have this weird encounter. And we're going to learn a bit about the background because I've just thought of some cool ideas about how the atmosphere works. I'm going to make some stuff out about rays because I've just read this thing about rays. Let's have some of that in there. Then, then it's time back to the space battle. <laughs> then we need to have the princess back again. Uh, you know, that's that's. <laughs> That's how it comes across to me. Um, so far, I would say, yeah, I would, I would agree with you, Gian. I think War of the World stands head and shoulders above all of these novels so far, um, as, as in terms of, of of being one that stands the test of time the best. But um, this was this had some good stuff in it. It just didn't kind of hang together entirely. I didn't think. But um, you know, good on Edgar Rice Burroughs for bringing us, I, I suppose, a bit more characterization into it. Um, um, compared to some of the other stories and in some ways a little bit more readable i.e. the English was easier than other ones um, so Burroughs wrote it as a serialised throwaway romp so he knew his audience of the day so I mean it reads like that doesn't it it's kind of like it's it's, it's, it's yeah he's just kind of making stuff up which is which is fine you know it's, that's what we do <laughs> so that's quite good um, so yeah what would I give it out of 10 I'd probably give it a five and a half, six out of ten. Something like that. I think overall, you know, had potential, could have been tighter. But uh, there we go. So <laughs> one out of ten, says over in Bruce. <laughs> right, I suppose that brings the questioners. Okay, so what are we gonna what are we gonna look at take a look at next? Um does anybody have any suggestions for for uh, science fiction novels that uh, we have available to us? Saturday afternoon cinema stuff. Yeah, I tend to agree with that. Uh, all the children, that sort of makes sense um because um yeah there's 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 lots of free stuff on project gutenberg but um 
we haven't done have we got any Frederick Pohl because his stuff is just weird um, is he I'm not suggesting anything let's have a let's have a quick look um, C.S. Lewis is C.S. Lewis um, let's have a quick look see what's about Folk Tales of the Mygars I think that's his isn't it no let's just try Lewis Alice's, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. Now that's that's not science fiction, but that's pretty darn weird. Um, I don't think so. Um, Frederick Pohl, a Perlandria. Um, let's have a look, let's have a look for Pohl. Um, my dad used to like him. Okay, so yeah, so there are, there's there's definitely um, Frederick Pohl. So does I don't know much about Frederick Pohl stuff. Um, does anybody know a well-regarded Frederick Pohl that we could sink our teeth into? Philip K. Dick is another one. Yes, so we've definitely got some Frederick Pohls. That's good. Um, let's let's leave that tab open while we go and have a look at. Another one, uh, gateway. Okay, so is a gateway here? Frederick Pohl gateway. Hmm. I was thinking, no records found. Maybe just search. I don't think this search engine hit on here is very good um never read him yeah so okay so it doesn't look like we've got gateway doesn't look like it's available which is odd um so winter mute have a look at the list that's oh hang on a minute because i'm i'm kind of these are the ones we've got for frederick pole here so we've got tunnel under the world search the sky a Plague of Pythons, Wolfbane, Let the Ants Try, Survival Kit, The Hated, Five Hells of Orion, Grace, Actual and Habitual, <laughs> Engineer, A Hitch in Time, that sounds like <laughs> very exciting, uh, Thrilling Wonder Stories, <laughs> um, then we've got Day of the Boomer Dukes, Lady Greensleeves, Asteroid of the Damned, The Knights of Arthur, Pythias, Conspiracy on Callisto. Tunnel under the world. Tunnel under the world. Okay, well, let's. What is that one all about? How long is it? I suppose. Let's click on that one. Most of the best poll books were in the seventies. Okay, so uh, this one's nineteen ninety-five ish. Looking at that, Gateway was seventy-seven. So maybe it's too new or something. Um, this one doesn't look like it's very long, so let's go. Let's well, let's just um, let's let's go with Frederick Pohl because he's he's quite famous as a, a classical science fiction author. Let's go for Tunnel Under the World by Frederick Pohl. Let's just have a look at Philip K. Dick for a future update and see if um, there are any others. Does he have any in here? Ah, oh, yes, so there we are. The eyes have it. So there are some Philip K. Dick stories as well. 14 by Philip K. Dick. Okay, so we, we can have a look at that as well. So, yeah, so there are some Philip K. Dick stories as well. Uh, but let's let's go for let's go for next week for The Tunnel Under the World by Frederick Pohl. Let's let's um, let's give that one a whirl because this is quite a little bit more modern now. So we've gone from 1912 to 1955. Uh, so we're moving up um, um, and we'll, we'll see see how that goes and then we'll, we'll choose a short, a short story from um, Philip K. Dick as well and give that one a whirl so so Frederick Pohl for next week my friends Frederick Pohl Tunnel Under the World read that one 
and um, we will uh, we'll see see what that's like. Bum, bum, bum. <laughs> and uh, we'll go we'll keep going through um, these 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 past masters of science fiction. See, so you, we can see where we come from. You see, it's it's important stuff. Um, so. Um, yeah, so Fred Pohl, Tunnel of the World. That's that's definitely what we're going for. So um, dive into that one, see what you think. And um, I've not I've not read any Frederick Pohl for quite some time. So um, yeah, so um, let, let's dive into that. Let's see what happens. So that'll be next week's book club. So um, Thursday this week, we are going to start a new space game. I'm going to try Spaceborn 2 uh, on Thursday. For Friday is the usual... Um, uh, Star Citizen, and I'm hoping on Saturday we will finally defeat the Empire with the destruction of the Death Star in Star Wars X-Wing. So fingers crossed on that one. And then um, back next week, obviously, for more um, amazing science fiction adventure story. Um, as long as no John Carter, I'm going to be deliriously happy, says Commander Hopi Briss. Uh, there we go. So good stuff. <laughs> anyway, my friends, look after yourselves. Be good. Hope you've had a good bank holiday weekend if you're in the UK. If you're not in the UK, you've had a good day at work. We're about to have a good day at work or wherever a part of the planet you're on. Um, but have a fantastic rest of the week. I will see you all soon. Look out for Thursday. And as always, my friends, right on. <laughs> Take it easy and see you soon. <laughs>